Welcome to Comics Bazaar, the channel of comics commentary and arcana. This video features the Uncanny X-Men number 262, cover dated June 1990. So the cover here by guest artist Kieran Dwyer and inker Joseph Rubenstein, who's also the inker um, of uh, Dwyer's work inside the issue, features Forge kneeling over the um, knocked out body of Banshee and then a mysterious figure here coming through uh, the smoke with these uh, tentacles uh, um, about to grab, presumably, Forge. Um, so, interesting enough cover. Um, um, and something that um, surprises me, though, is that um, Jim Lee wasn't tapped to do a guest cover for this issue, seeing as how he provided guest covers for issues that were penciled by Silvestri. Um, and this marks the beginning of a period um, of guest pencilers um, on uh, Uncanny X-Men um, before a new regular penciler in Jim Lee is, um, arrives with um, X-Men 267 and officially 268. So uh, the splash page here features um, a um, doppelganger, a monstrous doppelganger of Jean Grey. Um, who is uh, standing over uh, the knocked out body of the real uh, Jean Grey, abducted um, in the previous issue by these uh, monstrous uh, grotesques of the X-Men, long shot there, Wolverine, and so on and so forth. So the creative team is Chris Claremont Ryder, as always, but Kieran Dwyer, guest penciler, um, coming off a two-year run on Captain America, so um, an established penciler by this point. Uh, Joseph Rubenstein, guest inker, Glynis Oliver, colorist, and Tom Orzakowski, uh, letterer. So there's some um, dialogue here by Forge, who's filling Banshee in on what he can see through his uh, telescopic sights. And um, then we have this uh, horrifying image uh, that we saw in the previous issue of this um, tongue or um, strange oral appendage that also bears genes. Uh, face emerging from this figure and this really uh, shocks Forge here and um, he's asking Van Shi who is in the position of leader between the duo as to whether he goes or doesn't go and Van Shi is uh, reluctant to sanction Forge uh, shooting uh, this monster and um, so uh, Van Shi goes into action with his um, sonic scream and Forge uses a stun grenade on these monsters and then they teleport out uh, with the bamf sound that is uh, usually associated with Nightcrawler. So then they f um, Banshee flies in, Forge arrives and uh, they rescue the unconscious Jean. So she's all right, it seems, to Banshee. So then back at the underground complex beneath uh, the ruins of the X-Mansion, uh, they get Jean into one of Moira's new um, uniforms, X-Men uniforms, which it's um, explained uh, that they are, uh, by Banshee, they're a quantum improvement on the originals. Forge says, functions as body armor and an environment suit. Um, so, um, um, pretty cool um, updates of the old X-Men uniforms. And to Banshee's eyes, a little bit... Um, uh, spicier than the old uh, uniforms in the way that they're cut. So then they get into some serious discussion about uh, the uh, X-Men missing and uh, Jean um, offers X-Factor's help um, and then they have a little argument about uh, the X-Men faking their deaths and, um, and Jean reveals that she knows about the X that the X-Men are alive but uh, this goes back to Inferno but as she says here, I'm sorry, they made us promise not to tell. Um, and Forge uh, tells Banshee to uh, take it easy, to cut the X-Men some slack, because um, it probably made sense to them at the time. And of course, there's a little bit of irony because Banshee and Forge, well, on Banshee's suggestion, are taking advantage of the fact that people probably believe they're dead. Um, on account of their chartered plane blowing up on Kiranos um, in the Mediterranean. So then Banshee and Forge fill in Jean on the X-Men's uh, nemesis, uh, Donald Pearson, the Reavers, 
and the recent attack on Morail. And Q um, are seen cutting to uh, California and um, a um, factory of Frost Technotic, Technotics, uh, which is attacked by the Reavers. And Lady that strike is there as well. And um, they get this uh, poor security guard to uh, send a message that they're going to keep hitting Frost Industry assets um, until they catch up with Emma herself. And this is all part of Donald Pierce's um, scheme to get back at the inner circle of the Hellfire Club uh, from which he was ejected. So then we go back to the X-Men complex um, under the ruins of the X-Mansion and we have um, further discussion about what's been going on and Moira instructed them to uh, send or instructed Callisto to seal the complex against intruders uh, but that she's gone missing and um, and so they're wondering whether the creatures grabbed Callisto as well and as uh, Banshee concludes there well it's a possibility so um, Jean rings X-Factor to call them in to help but they're away so um, they're left by themselves here this um, our trio and then Forge um, wants to uh, check on um, his colleagues um, and in terms of whether uh, any um, effect has been had on them uh, by contact with the monsters. So he says he's going to inject um, Gene with a broad spectrum antibiotic, but he does something else as well. He takes, um, he puts in a tracker as well without telling her and the same to Banshee. So Forge being um, sneaky and crafty there, but ultimately it pays off. And when Banshee and uh, Gene walk out of uh, the central um, operation center and away from the shielding there, they're teleported away by presumably whoever's doing the teleporting for the monsters. So um, Forge is left by himself and frustrated, but he has injected those trackers into them. And then we got an interesting scene set in the White House, Washington DC, where we've got the Secretary of State and Val Cooper, and they have Pipeline there who is uh, digitally porting in um, a Genosian uh, diplomat and Chief Ad uh, Magistrate Anderson and some anonymous uh, mutate there. And um, so the Secret Service um, emerge, but Val tells them to uh, that everything's okay and they should head away. And then we have the Genosian diplomat um, asking the Secretary of State for uh, the US's cooperation in extraditing um, Philip Moreau and Jenny Ransom. Um, who are living in um, Soho, New York, but the Genosians want them back. And then we get a little bit of um, dialogue between Val Cooper and um, Chief Magistrate Anderson regarding the mutate, where uh, uh, Magistrate Anderson um, refers to the mutate as a reference module accompanying the foreign, foreign minister. And Val is absolutely disgusted and says, that's a person, a human being. And Magistrate Anderson responds, it is a specifically configured piece of genetic engineering, Dr. Cooper, with no more humanity than any other piece of technology, as is the module we seek to retrieve. And that's a reference to Jenny Ransom. Um, and when the Secretary of State refers to Jenny as Jennifer Ransom by her name, uh, the Genosian diplomat says there is no such person, Governor. We are attempting to reclaim a pirated unit of biotechnology with the identifying number 9817 and the extradition for trial of a young man accused of high treason. That's her boyfriend, Philip. And then the mutate provides visuals of them, holographic visuals. So once again, um, any new readers are caught up on um, the apartheid slave state of Genosha, what it's all about, it's inhumanity. And then we have this um, private discussion between the Secretary of State and Val, where the Secretary of State is um, 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 appalled at the Genosians threatening the United States. And who the devil does the diplomat think he is? And he asks uh, Val, is there anything we can do? And she thinks, can, do, not should. So much for the moral side of the equation. So interesting, subtle, 
um, perspectives here um, on this um, diplomatic um, uh, quandary uh, for U.S. Genosian relations, and we also learn that um, Genosha um, is um, a an ally of the United States, and also that the United States um, owes Genosha thirty-five billion dollars um, in debt. So. Um, an interesting relationship established here between um, the US and Genosha. And um, Val imagines that there is um, prospectively um, a, a war. If it comes to that a war, you better tell the president there's no guarantee we'll win. So high stakes here. And then we switch back to Forge, who's going through the tunnels that lead from beneath um, Xavier's mansion through Salem and all the way into Manhattan, um, ultimately becoming Morlock tunnels. And as he is making his way, following the trail, or sorry, um, yeah, tracking uh, Banshee and uh, Jean, um, he reminisces about um, his um, time in Vietnam how Naze last seen in Fall of the Mutants when he was possessed by the adversary um, is arguing with Forge not to uh, go to war, um, that he has a more important destiny. But young Forge um, has his way, um, enlists, goes through basic training, proves um, really good at, um, at um, um, shooting um, as the um, Instructor says here, you're the best natural shot I ever seen, but target same people. And Young Forge says, no sweat, Sarge. Whatever comes, I can handle it. So we, we keep getting this intercutting of Forge going through the tunnels and um, flashbacks to Vietnam, his time in Vietnam. And we learn that he was part of a group uh, called the Marauders, uh, funnily enough. And then finally, he comes upon these monsters that have taken on uh, the some of the physical features of some of the X-Men. So this one here, um, Storm. And of course, this is an emotional jolt for Forge. And just at this point, he's uh, we're uh, getting the flashback to uh, maybe what is his first kill um, in Vietnam, where he shoots this uh, young member of the Viet Cong. And, um, and then we have um, another scene switch to uh, Manhattan. Um, as the narrative caption says, along the fringes where Soho merges with Tribeca. We see the twin towers there um, in the skyline. And uh, we are at a hip exclusive gallery where Peter Nicholas, who is the amnesiac colossus on the other side of the Siege Perilous, exhibiting his art. And the narrative um, captions tell us no one knows where he comes from, but with a face and body like his, not to mention the raw artistic talent so vividly on display, who cares? Now this is a nice panel by um, Kieran Dwyer here and some use of um, duo shade um, here as well for the pattern on this guy's um, suit jacket. And, um, and then we have this mysterious woman um, in a fur coat, it seems, outside the gallery looking in and Peter catches sight of her and he pushes his way through the crowd, but she's already running away into a waiting limo. And Jenny Ransom happens on the scene, stops the limo, opens it up, but um, the mysterious woman is not there. She's gone. Um, so let's continue with the story. So we switch back to the apartment building and the loft studio where Peter is living. And these two panels are cribbed um, or swiped by Dwyer from Uncanny X-Men 259. He's copying Silvestri here. Um, and uh, we also learn that he is thoroughly obsessed with this mysterious woman, but that his art has been um, changing and whereby sometimes he's drawing her uh, with scarring and um, a kind of an ugly side to her as well. And he's curious about um, what that has to do with how she's uh, how her image is hard or cruel or horribly scarred. I must be mad to even dream of destroying sh such beauty. It isn't fair. Why won't she leave me alone? And then she's at his door. Perhaps I'm a moth, she says, and you're my flame. But behind her, suddenly, mask. And, um, 
and uh, Peter is by the uh, by the sound effect teleported away so perhaps these monsters have something to do with mask and the Morlocks yes and then our scene switches back to Forge and his reminiscences or his memories of uh, Vietnam and this is interesting because this is um, Harry Malone uh, the leader of uh, the Harriers uh, last seen in the previous issue 261 so hard case is his code name and here he is trying to recruit um, uh, Forge for uh, some kind of um, special unit uh, so Malone is carrying a message from Nick Fury um, and uh, Forge has um, 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 he has um, uh, wrote, risen in rank so now he's a sergeant and um, he uh, says he's obliged for Malone's offer but he'll pass uh, he says he's got a good team of people here my job's to bring him home safe and sound alive and whole and um, he thinks back looking at a photo that he's brought with him should have taken the sergeant major's offer but this is interesting because it was established in the previous issue 261 that wolverine and malone go back and also wolverine has been hallucinating phantoms of nick fury as a sergeant uh not colonel and also carol danvers and it seems claremont was setting up a backstory for Wolverine and this is also developed in upcoming Uncanny X-Men 268 that places Wolverine um, in World War II and that Claremont was working up that maybe Wolverine was part of a special op te ops team going back to World War II all the way through Vietnam um, probably the Korean War as well um, under the command of Nick Fury um, and that also involved this guy here, this um, British guy, Harry Malone. Um, so uh, interesting stuff, but that never came to full fruition because, of course, of Claremont's upcoming 1991 abrupt departure from the X-Men and from Marvel Comics. So back to the story and Forge um, tracking uh, Banshee and uh, Jean. So he ultimately uh, finds a cavern that is filled with these grotesques of the X-Men, bearing all their different faces, um, including Eliana here. And um, he is uh, blindsided by one of them that bears the face of the beast. And then we've got this uh, weird grotesque of Angel, as he thinks it's got the, a woman's body, but, an, but Angel's face. So all kinds of mix-ups going on with these monstrous creatures. And um, then we have a physical fight here and he's grabbed by this, um, or actually he's aided by Banshee, but what he can't understand is why Banshee isn't using his sonic powers to protect himself, but we'll learn why that is very, very shortly. So then Forge uh, uses his uh, gun to take out uh, the storm monster which is uh, garroting Banshee. So he's forced to do it to save Banshee's life. And, um, and then the monster is Scarper, as he says, using lingo picked up in Vietnam. They did him out back down their hole. And then we have him uh, kneeling over the body of um, the storm monster, um, thinking back about his first kill in Vietnam, how he's the best with a rifle and taking a life that is indeed a whole lot different from popping a piece of cardboard but like anything you get used to it and try to help others do the same so actually here in this uh, reminiscence he as sergeant is helping one of his team to deal with having killed uh, one of the Vietnamese um, Viet Cong soldiers and then um, Jean shows up well it turns out to be gene save your grief forge that isn't storm um you with banshee then is he okay as well as can be expected she responds all things considered we both are i'm sorry for it sean can't speak for himself right now i'm afraid since you last saw us and this is a perfect like turn the page and what are we going to see there have been some changes so monstrous changes for gene with these uh tentacles um, in place of her arms and Banshee with no mouth so that's why he can't use his um, sonic scream 
next the lower depths okay so um, an interesting issue um, not exactly the level and standard of art uh, that we've been um, uh, used to on Uncanny X-Men you know uh, fill in artists of the caliber of Barry Windsor Smith Rick Leonardi Alan Davis and now Kieran Dwyer not at their level uh, not quite ready for the prime time of Marvel's um, best-selling book um, of 1990 um, excluding um, the relaunched uh, Top McFarlane Spider-Man um, so but but serviceable art nonetheless and the guy at 23 really doing his best here um, so I hope that you enjoyed this review of Uncanny X-Men 262 if you did please like the video and if you haven't done so already subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for more content like this